work for a marketing company. We focus on high-rise condominiums. Um, and basically, what helped me to, I guess, I came to the program was because I studied in Costa Rica for a year, which I never <coughs> told you. And it was more theoretical. So you were picky Spanish? My accent with the Spanish doesn't sound too good. Like, nombre es Olivia. <laughs> um, but it was more theoretical, more field work, like we went to Chiquita Farms, um, the pineapple farms, and I guess like it's more industrial. So coming here, it's more you know numbers and stuff. And I had the privilege of taking a science design Miguel class in capital markets last semester. And it just opened my eyes to more of the stock market. Mm. So I feel like I could make a, a lot of, I mean, I'll say quick money that way. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> more in terms of gambling. There is, I, I there like is it's, no. It's kind of like almost the same thing. No, it's not. Yeah, it is I not know, a game of chance. I know. It's I know, not a game I know, of I chance. I'm saying, but I just feel like I have more hope in terms of trying to make that extra money for myself instead of getting it from the government or. <laughs> this sounds there. dangerous. <laughs> This is, that's why I'm afraid sometimes that some of the topics that I cover in the class is not intended to make people day traders. I mean, some of the tools you could use personally, but hopefully you use those tools to mitigate or minimize potential losses. Right, exactly. Right, right. rather than spare change. Rather than making quick money. Exactly, exactly. Okay. All right. Well, listen. Little uh, for quick money. I am. Uh, uh, the, the only thing that I was going to add, we'll take a little break, I want to just add a couple of things, is, or, um, I've, I've offered, and I, I shouldn't say I've offered, I, in the past I used to do office hours on, um, I used to, I, I started with Skype, then I went to like Google Hangout, and then I started doing them on GoToMeeting. I haven't done them for a while because what started happening was I'd get online and nobody would come, and it's like, you know, like, can you imagine if you throw a party and nobody comes? <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not good. And I, I actually even tell a story, a student who is supposed to be here, I don't know if you're still in the class or not, but... Or in the country. Or who knows, who knows. Uh, he did send in, it's a student who did send in a case study, late, 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 I, late, but he did send in a case study. Uh, but I'm not saying his name, but... We'll see him in the last one. It was you. <laughs> No, but uh, you know he he asked for office hours one day, and I I went online, <laughs> and the guy never showed up. And you know, he not only didn't show up, he didn't like when I called him out on it, he didn't even like apologize or whatever. He's like, oh yeah, you're right, you know. <laughs> so um, I'm happy. It's a great this go to meeting is a great tool. If you worked at Citrix, you know, maybe you know the product well. You probably know it. Maybe you can give me like some tips on it or whatever. Right? No, but um, uh, you know whether it's go go to. I guess are they. I don't know, are you still at Citrix or not? No, no, no. I think they're discontinuing the go-to meeting tool that they're going to focus on go-to training. Entity, uh, are there what? I think they're a different entity now. They moved away from Citrix. And okay, Colorado. okay. So, well, what, but whatever. But it's, they're great tools. So if you find during the course of the term that, you know, doing something, you know, more interactively is helpful, you know, we can coordinate that. But I don't want to set it up and then you guys don't show up, okay? But... You know, with a tool, we could share screens and things like that. So that's one thing. Um, I will send you periodic um, um, grades in the capital markets class. It's kind of hard because we don't have grading <coughs> sessions every period. But in this class, we'll have grades at every, you know, for every session. So I'll send you uh, progress reports on your grades. So you'll know, hopefully, every week where you stand, OK? You shouldn't have any issues with that. Um, I typically bring current events. I didn't bring that many this week. And let me just see if I have anything that's worth going over because I'd like to have a break. Yeah, just a couple of things. There's a couple of things I want to just mention that are interesting. I'm, I'm ha I was having a conversation with a former student earlier in the week and he's working for a development business that of all places is doing stuff in, in Reno and now they're starting to do stuff in Nevada. But they've got, I think they're up to like six or seven multifamily deals in Reno. And why are they in Reno? Well, if, if anybody's involved in commercial real estate in South Florida, you realize that uh, pricing is really tough, really, really tough. And so, you know, we're, we're not quite a 24-hour city, but we're attractive enough, for instance, 
has a port, major port city that industrial is, is essentially owned by um, you know one big REIT and two or three large institutions. There's another REIT, kind of a couple other REITs at play, but most of the industrial of any value here is institutionally owned. All the CBD that's worth anything is institutionally owned, and all this stuff is you know four and a half, five cap rate type stuff. Most of the multifamily of any value is four to five cap rate stuff, and so what happens is if you don't really have access to core type money, and most development you know is looking for opportunity type money, value plus opportunity type money, the opportunities aren't here. They're not here, so you got to go somewhere else. So, and and the problem that that poses in a real estate arena is that real estate is very much a local business. I was I was in the pool at the yacht club this morning, or I, I, I live in Key Biscayne, there's a yacht club there, and so I use the pool there, and they've just built a new a new, a new pier. They had to rebuild the pier or whatever, so it's been done for like three weeks, four weeks, they inaugurated it, but they can't open it, because Durham, the, right, the Environmental Regulatory Agency hasn't issued the permits. So I was talking to one of the guys while I was doing my laps or whatever, and he says, well, they decided to put everything under one permit instead of breaking up the fuel dock from the rest of the other. And I said, well, you know, it's probably what the construction company that did it, you know, suggested, and that's what they do all the time. But the problem when you're doing development, for example, you really don't know the timing. There's a lot of uncertainty associated with it. And the closer you are to an arena, the closer you are to regulatory bodies, the more of a personal relationship. This is a know-who business as much as it is a know-how business, right? the better off you are. So it's very difficult to land in Reno or Nashville or you know or Knoxville or Tuscaloosa or Austin and do work because you don't know the local code. You don't know the local inspectors. You don't know the politicians that are going to. So it's very difficult. But, uh, but, but you know, it's almost a necessity if you want to development that you've got to sort of pack up and go. But kind of curiously, uh, you know, I, I pick up from one of the many sources that I get of, of, of junk during the week. Apple's planning a $1 billion data center in Reno, and Tesla's doing stuff in Reno. So these guys started nibbling at Reno, and then Tesla announced this thing. And now, now that they're sort of in, you know, Apple announces this. And actually, they locked up a 94-unit multifamily project, I guess, two or three weeks ago. They're in the process of, you know, lining up the financing, and they're getting ready to close. And all of a sudden, Apple announces this, and this plant's like two blocks away from their multifamily. So it's like... Boom, they've hit a home run, you know. But this is the kind of stuff that, you know, the more you've got your ear to the ground and you know what's happening, you know, the more intelligent or informed decisions that you can make. Sometimes they involve risk, okay. I, I don't like to bring, you know, necessarily, but I always wind up bringing my personal investment decisions to class because right, wrong, or indifferent, sometimes they work out well, sometimes they don't. I'm, I'm very much with stocks of value players, so I don't believe in making money today, <laughs> Olivia. I, I plan on making money over right. time. Yeah. And, and I use a series of tools that ultimately help me identify companies that I, I then dig up. I'm not a technician. I, I believe in fundamental analysis. So I, I look at balance sheets and I, all the ratio analysis that hopefully you'll learn in this class, I use. Um, but by definition, I'm finding companies that today are not in a good place uh, from a stock valuation perspective. So you know, I, when I find companies whose whose um, financial underpinnings or attributes are attractive to me, they typically are not attractive to the market. And so what happens is is you have to have a long term view or perspective sometimes. You know, now something <coughs> could be wrong, the timing could be off. I mean, you know, lately what I've what I've started to delve into lately is retail. Now, I'm not buying J.C. Penney, okay? I'm not buying Sears Holdings, okay? Um, but I'm finding that there are some, um, you know, very, very well managed, low debt, profitable businesses that have been beat, beat up. Now, can I expect to make money today or tomorrow? No, you know, a couple of these companies announced that their sales are down two or three percent. So okay, well, that's never good. But the market's not down their value as if sales are down 30 or 40 percent, or as if they're not going to be there tomorrow. You know, somebody was mentioning the other day. I'm not a big JP, JC Penny type um, fan. I, I think those large department stores are, those they're challenged. Now there's 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 some that will survive. Macy's will survive in some form. Nordstrom's will likely survive in some form. You know, maybe Kohl's, whatever. 
J.C. Penney's, they're like, to me, they're a no man's land. But there was a guy I was listening to the other day, and he said, hey, the valuation on that is assuming that they're going to go out of business. Maybe that's, you know, sort of an interesting opportunity, okay? But, but my point, again, is, is, is sometimes you've got, especially in real estate, you've got to make the bet when everybody's against you. The guy that makes the money in development is the guy that breaks ground when the world's coming to an end. Because when he's done in three years, we're coming out of the bad cycle into the good one. And the guy that loses his shirt is the guy that's developing today as we're nearing the end of a cycle. And so we need to understand what's happening in cycles and what's happening in the economic environments and the places that we are. It goes back to what I said before, knowledge is power. The more that we know, the more that we know, the better professionals that we can become. I, I'm not going to go through all of these articles on this, but you know, it's um, some shopping center read executives are pushing back against the fallout. You know, uh, uh, well, this is just another one. You know, so, so, uh, these pop-up stores are sort of a kind of curiosity that's filling up empty spaces in some places where, you know, people are. You know, pop-up stores are right. I mean, I assuming no, yes, no, yes, no. You're not. You don't know what a pop-up store is. No, it's a pop-up store. So like, uh, like maybe I I make bracelets or something like that, right? Oh, it's and like so, a kiosk. Well, or I actually take a space. Like I have. Uh, the people I stay with in Spain, the, the oldest son, uh, who's an architect, his wife runs um, like a small clothing, sort of up and coming clothing business with her mother. And they'd had, her dad had had a very large chain that went bankrupt some years ago. So they're very, sort of very conservative. So they've got one store in Barcelona, but when they go to all the other major cities in Spain, they'll go to Madrid and rent a locale for two or three weeks. And they'll have a limited showing, and they'll do a bunch of events. They'll bring all the inventory, and so and that's becoming sort of a trend. I mean, I don't know, but in this country, you're starting to see it. It's not just sort of a floating market kind of thing. I see the Halloween stores. They come and rent three months ahead of the Halloween, yeah. and then they're gone. I saw. Now, this is not a a store per se, but a, a couple blocks. I was at my parents' house yesterday. A couple blocks from their house, there's a. Um, like a Salvation Army thing or something. And in that lot there, there is the 4th of July, they sell fireworks. Christmas, they sell trees. The one I saw yesterday, they got Mother's Day flowers. I'd never seen that one before, you know? But it's the concept from a real estate operator's perspective of, I can't lease this all the time, but you know what? I'm gonna create venues or events here, you know? And so this is something typical, this is, blossoming all over Southern California where else everything you know sort of starts in California in this country but so the whole concept of all these empty spaces and some of the malls are going that way right um, this is an interesting one that um, one of the things that people have said as it relates to retail is is that um, groceries probably are the ones that are more insulated because we got by and um, uh, if we sort of extend that to, to re real estate, REITs and other property owners that are more focused on the grocery anchor type you know, store are going to be more insulated. Well, there's a whole disruption going on in that industry as well. And it's not just Amazon, but now you've got two big German firms that are expanding, Aldi and Lidl, which are, you know, which are expanding in this country. And these are it's a totally different concept. You know, you go in and like you, you got to buy a pallet worth of stuff, and it's all white goods, and so. Costco, Costco just starting uh, delivery. You know, and, and Amazon Fresh is in, in Dade County. I don't think they're in Broward, but I went online the other day. I mean, I, I don't like shopping, but I do like going to the supermarket. You know, I should say this. Huh? You know, you like you see a pretty girl and you run your card into her. No, I'm just kidding. That was like for happy days. I didn't. I never did that. Okay. No, I I actually enjoy looking at like food and like. Like, I like to squeeze fruits and stuff, you know? I don't, like, I see these Instacart people going by me, and I'm like, I would never, like, have somebody just bring me stuff. It, it doesn't feel right, you know? But they've got incredible, Amazon Fresh has incredible variety, you know? And there's some stuff that you actually don't have to pick that they could probably bring you at a pretty full So, there's okay. so a lot of disruption in the underlying business, and there will be implications to the real estate arena. now. What are those implications? Does that mean that there's more distribution space and less retail space? Does that mean that there's still the same amount of retail space, but the business model doesn't allow for the same level rents? 
I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that is. But if that's the arena that you want to play in, you got to you got to be reading. You got to be reading the tea leaves all the times, right? You know. So, um, yeah. So there's all kinds of you know stuff on that. Did you see? Did you happen to see the Amazon? Um, their the grocery stores that they were planning on. I, mean, I guess they kind of nixed that one, but well, no, they they actually they've got some small ones out west. Like they, I think in Seattle, they actually have like sort of a small platform you, store. You take it off the shelf and your phone records it. What you yeah, it, it, I don't know if it's yeah. Like I didn't, so cool. no, what they were having problems with the technology. Yeah. It's so the whole concept was again low cost. You pull it. I didn't know it was your phone, but somehow. Mm -hmm. It tracked what you were taking, so you don't even have to go to the you know thing it's in the well, The problem is, is that they can't scale it past ten people shopping at the same, at the same time because they're it, fix that. Of yeah. course, they'll fix that. So it's just so, but but stuff's happening, and so again, does that mean that retailing goes away? I don't think so. Does that mean that retail real estate goes away? I don't think so. But I was talking to my brother. Those of you who who mm -hmm. take it, my brother sells pretzels for a living. You know, he makes those like empty on pretzels and sells them, okay? So uh, they've got, I don't know, they, I'm in this deal too, like 30. We, I make pretzels too. <laughs> they've got, <laughs> we have, and needless to say, I got another memo last week that, no, they didn't make their sales again last month. And then my nephew calls me and says, my brother's looking for an Aston Martin. And I said, are you with your dad right now? Yeah, I go, you tell him I want dividends and distributions and to forget his cars, okay? <laughs> but he did buy the Aston Martin. So, oh. and he, but, but, um, uh, you should bring the pretzels next week. I, I, they're all, none of the stores. Next, 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 I don't know if any, actually, I don't even have coupons. I, I know. Oh, yeah, I'm one of the owners. No, this is, this is the second big deal he gets me in. Don't ask me how the first one wound up. Okay. <laughs> No, but, um, but you know, talk, I talked to my brother before one of the classes last time because I really did want to know how, and they've definitely seen a reduction in foot traffic. And what, what he's told me is, so they've got a couple of bad malls. And so, like I said, the bad malls. I think one of them, I think it, yeah, I think it's like Galleria or something. One of them was really bad. And he was like, wherever, I don't know. I should know, but I don't know. No, 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 no. The, no, the business is headquartered up in like Delray, but the, the stores are like, you know, up in New York and Pennsylvania and stuff, and they've got some in Puerto Rico. They're all over the place. But, but my point is, um, so they, what he's told me is, in the two or three bad malls they've got stores, foot traffic is way down, mm -hmm. and as a consequence, their volume is way down. But he says the really high-end malls that they're at, everything's the same. Nothing's changed, you know. So. Uh, they haven't seen growth, but they haven't really seen reductions, okay? But but the conversation I had with him was that, you know, you've heard, I think there's like um, something like 2,200 large malls in this country. And some people have said that that needs to be like, you know, reduced. I read by like three or 400. My brother, you know, told me, said, some people say it's like as much as 800. Now, again, I don't know what the right answer is. What has been a fact is, is that the growth strategy for most retailers has been to just expand footprint and it seems like that's just gone a little bit too far right and that's definitely played to the real estate arena because you just build more venues you know build it and people will come well it seems like that's not happening anymore and so as as you know people are retrenching and saying hey I don't need 1200 stores I could probably do with 800 you know start doing the math right uh, I think we did the math in the class when, in the last class, there was a, a retailer. What was it called? It was an outdoor business? Gander? Gander Mountain or something like that. So, you know, Gander Mountain was a retailer uh, based out of Minnesota or something. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a, like a, I think it was more of like a Bass Pro Shop than a Dick's, but some sort of common. But they only had like 40 stores or 50 stores, but we did the math here and it was like, you know, all of a sudden, when they're closing, you suck out a couple hundred million dollars out of the economy in rents every year. You know, just do the math. X number of stores at X number of square feet at X dollars per square foot, and that's gone. You know, so you're a property owner, or collectively property owners now have $200 million less of NOI because that drops straight to the bottom line, you know? <laughs> um, so, anyway. Um,
I, I, I'm not going to spend time talking about CMBSs other than to say that uh, uh, the overall delinquency rate in this country is almost 6% on um, CMBSs. And that, that's kind of frightening. But, um, uh, you know, the sort of good news, there's always good news and bad news, is uh, the good news if you talk to people, there's so much dry powder sitting on the sideline willing to invest in real estate that it will likely get worked out, you know. So, um, that, you know, that's one beauty of this country is there's so much debt to, you know, most industries. Uh, and there's always someone that's willing to take a risk, right? There's someone willing um, to do stuff. So, um, I had mentioned that KK, KKR was going to float a uh, like a mortgage re. They've done that. And going back to um, this uh, this intermediation of the banking, and I, I don't want to get into that in this class. Here's one that's interesting, and this is when we got this is when you got to start re reading tea leaves. Manhattan off office landlords are sweetening offers, and so it says that um, 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 there's a steady stream of office space coming online in Manhattan, and the landlords are now starting to have to work harder to lure the tenants. And they are expanding free rent and increasing build out allowances, okay, for you know, real estate professionals say. Now this comes out of the Wall Street Journal. The first sign, the first, by the way, that was like on Tuesday. The Thursday I read the same thing for San Francisco. San Francisco rents are still going up, but concessions now are starting to go up. Um, I may show for you office, one of for office or for office. I may show you in, 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 in one of the sessions, either next week or the following one, I took the time to, to send, I, I wasted a whole morning one day last year writing to one of the publications that I read a, a suggestion on how to analyze real estate businesses, REITs in particular. They never responded. I, it pissed me off. You know, I, I spent a lot of time, I sent them a seven page memo with a bunch of work. They didn't respond. Now curiously, they did a follow up story um, about two or three months ago, and embedded in their analysis were my tools. Okay, they didn't give me credit. They didn't give me credit. Okay, but they used what, I, and so I felt good. Okay, but I'm going to share that with you. And 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 and, and the thought was, one of the things that I did when I, I got rid of the sort of research group in our in our business. And, you know, that's when you're a CFO, you got to, and you make the big bucks, right? So you got to get it out of somewhere. No, you you got to always find the best. Um, you know, structure in a business, and, and you're the guy that's got to make the difficult decisions. The CFO is always the one that's got to make the tough decisions, okay? Um, marketing guys just want to spend money, you know, so. Um, but one of the things I did was I cut our, our research group because we were, you know, coming up with all kinds of information and all that. And I said, look, we're a development business. That's where we make our money. And whatever research we come up with should be for our internal consumption. I mean, I'm not going to compete with CBRE and Cushman or co-star or subscription services gathering information to give to our brokerage clients. I want research that feeds my my machinery and I want it to be exclusive. You know, so brokers got all pissed off because we weren't sending anything to the clients, but I thought we were putting together more rigorous and more focused research. And it ultimately focused, and again, I could be wrong, but it ultimately focused on the supply and demand paradigms of our industry. So, vacancies? rents, and absorption. And I can tell you invariably, when you start seeing vacancy, right, you know, start coming down, right, and and you see rents all of a sudden hitting that, you're very quickly going to see rents coming down at some point. And when, and you overlay that, and you put a third, you know, a third, you know, box on that chart, and you start seeing absorptions, I'll tell you that the minute the vacancies start to drop, and it's sort of crest on where rents begin to drop, you're going to see absorptions go way down as well, okay? And I think I'll, I'll define absorption later on, at least in accounting terms for you guys. But absorption is basically, you know, how much space has been, you know, leased in the market, so broadly. But there's, there's a mathematical way to calculate that. But the tea leaves don't lie. This is not a difficult business. And the first sign that you're reaching that, that crux before you even see vacancies go down is people got to push um, to get tenants. And they don't push first. The first line of defense is not lowering rents. Nobody wants to lower rents. Why don't you want to lower rents? Why don't you want to lower rents? 
Okay, so you tell everything you're telling me is good. Everything you're telling me is good. But there's one fundamental reason why you never want to rent, why you want to change the face. It directly affects the value. Because so, so how do you how do you give the tenants what they want without affecting the value? You give them stuff up front that doesn't impact this number. Yeah, free rent. So free rent. Free rent affects NOI though. Because well, but, 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 but stop the thing. Right, so an intelligent buyer, an intelligent buyer is going to look at effective rent, okay, when they're underwriting a deal. But the reality is, is when a deal is marketed, uh, free rent may impact my deal year one from a cash flow perspective. You're going to learn in accounting it doesn't. In accounting, in, 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 a, in gap, in gap, in, with generally accepted accounting principles, Free rent does not affect because we want to straight line rents, and we'll learn about that. But what's happening is in year five of that rent, um, of that lease, when you're selling the asset, the face rent on the face uh, uh, rate on that lease is going to be much higher than if you had sort of you know just give them a, a lower you know lease term from the beginning. And so what happens is in year three, four, five, six, whenever you market the asset, your NOI is going to be higher, and so. There is a direct correlation with value. So people are going to get more free rent. People are going to get more TI allowances. People will give you, you know, they'll help you with moves. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll give you signage. They'll, they'll buy out. You know, we'll go through that in the next session, all the different sort of concessions and how you account for them. Because there's, there's cash and then there's accounting, how we account for all that stuff. But the first thing that goes is when people start playing those games, to get tenants in the door, you start seeing you start, there's froth in the market. Now, I'm not saying that, that it doesn't then keep going later on, but but when you start seeing too much supply, uh, it starts pressuring it starts pressuring rents, and the first thing is people start giving is you know free rent, free rent, free rent, and multifamily. It's you know when no, things were bad, you gave a month, right? Now, months. what do you give? Well, nothing. Do you give anything today? Well, for an upfront, you instead of charging first last of security, say first and security or whatever. That, that would be a okay. Well, that's one thing. But are you giving any free rent today? In no, your, no, no. But in two thousand eight. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. It's just a sign of the times. No, no. It's a sign of the times. No, no. And and so like I mean so I'm going to give you broad numbers. I would look in Dade County two thousand eight two thousand nine average. You're giving like forty five days free rent. A year ago. It was like 15 days average, which meant real good properties weren't giving anything, and some of the you know lousy ones maybe were having to do something, you know, or you know, hey, hey, we'll give you a free month and do a 13 month deal, you know, only pay 12 or something like that. So, anyway, I want to take like a um, seven minute break. Let's start at at a quarter of at a quarter of three, okay. And if you're tired, I'm tired too. Okay? <laughs> But the, but the thing is, but the thing is, the, the, the thing is, this has the reverse Polish notation. So, if I want to add, I got to go enter. But if I want eight, I got to go eight plus. So it's kind of like an adding machine where you put the number, yeah. then you do the operation. And not all HPs are reverse Polish notation. You can download typically from the HP site. You can download the uh, the manuals. Yeah, that's right. And then, yeah. I, and then we started the, the, the 10 2 when we were quite as last, which is pretty easy. But uh, I, what, what I said, Angelo, is what's happening is. I don't know, I don't know what you're going to use. I, I've got. No, 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 no. I, no. no, no, you don't need to buy a calculator. I just, I just suggest you have a calculator because I think that that's just part of, like, you know. No, 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 no. Absolutely. So, a a Angelo, uh, but what I was telling you is, is I find that now most of the stuff that I do, I do, I do in Excel. Yeah. I just, I just, 
I just, you know. Harold, everything's good? Yeah. Yeah? Oh, this is it. When does this also Actually, teacher wants to hear. Uh, yeah, I don't. It's funny because I've taught. Like, it seems like I've taught like capital markets three times in the last year, and I and I haven't taught this since last summer. I, I it doesn't I. I don't know how that's worked out, but it's worked out that way. So, but I'm I'm not gonna teach. So we're, we're switching the capital markets class to more of a modeling type class. And I was going to teach it, but Dr. Ford, he's going to teach it now. Can you just send that also to another email then? Is that an elective class? Can I, can I well, the the no, you can look at all of them. Yeah. Um, no, 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 no. Uh, Gayon. Is that financial modeling? <laughs> no, it's just replacing. You know, listen, in the program, people got all bent out of shape the last time. I was like, oh, why are they changing it? But, we're always, you know, you're always updating. No, no, but some people are like, ooh. You, you always have to update the programming. Some of the stuff you drop, like we dropped, about a year and a half ago, we dropped the, the, the due diligence class. I thought that was an awesome class. Uh, and I only taught it two or three times. Somebody was teaching it before. Uh, they, but there's good knowledge in that class, you know? But, Look, we got dropped because at the time, you know, Dr. Ford, he thought that, you know, whatever else made more sense. So there's always... I'm just wondering if he's going to consider coming to modeling uh, a core class. No, 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 I don't, I don't, I think... Because if that's true, then um, he, he might change the class program next year. Right. Yeah. 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 In replacement of an elective class. Which I actually think that's pretty cool for an internship or a class. Yeah, it's kind of funny you said because I don't. One of my former players called me yesterday and he's actually playing for I Fortnite School at Fordham. And my brother's on a board at Fordham. So this guy calls me and he says, hey, coach, I need a favor. He goes, I got an internship. Which I knew. He had an internship. He got an internship with a media firm in New York for the summer. And he goes, I talked to the dean, and they want to charge me for the three, you know, for the three credits or whatever. And he goes, "Can you have your brother call?" The, and I'm like, "Dude, my brother's not going to call the dean." You know, but I was shocked that you get an internship, but you got kind of got to pay the school for it. It has to because and it, what he explained to me. You know, but 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 the other reason you know why is a lot of internships today are unpaid. And what's happening is it's actually the Department of Labor Directive that says an employer can give you an internship, but only, so otherwise it would be abusing you, okay? You'd be working for free, which you can't. Well, that's what I think, but that's not what the Department of Labor says. So the Department of Labor is saying you can give people free internships, but they have to be for credit because you can't, like, so you're providing something for that in exchange for what they're doing for you. There's two things I said about that. You mentioned something. You know, you know, you know, you know, so no one was asking me a question about, oh, you know, because I, you know, I'm going to start this business and so I want to have the development here and I want to have the, the ownership here and, and that's what they were. Okay, but then if you have the ownership here, then free project. So I started drawing, you know, a different structure. That's structuring. It's finding a way to do it. Framework. How you're going to have your business. And, 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 um, and you're saying 95 No, I, I, oh, good. listen. I, 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 well, I think there's supposed to be like a ceremony. There's no ceremony. But I don't think that this is going to give you what you need. 
what you need. I don't know. You need to tell us what you need. Tell us what you need. This gives you background information if you don't know anything. But of course, and then I send a text to you guys. Let me text you and check out the guys' passage. And then you guys reply saying, no, they're great. And then you need to intervene. That's why it's good background. Because attorneys don't understand what your objectives are. They know the law. And and, and attorneys are advocates. I woke up at 6.30. So if you tell an attorney, no, I woke up at 6.30. I want to see that. And I, I, sleep don't say, I walk in, I hear him if pray. Because I walk in the front door and I hear his voice. He's not an advocate. And an accountant, and we're going to get to this in this class, is independent by nature. So an accountant will say, well, wait a minute. What are your objectives? Let me tell you what's bad for you, okay? But if you don't want to turn it, oh, you don't want to turn it. 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 Yeah, you didn't see it? No, I didn't see it. Because you were sitting right there. There was a seat. I almost sat there and I looked at the paper yeah, yeah, and I go, yeah, yeah. Wait, this is the wrong class. <laughs> well, and are you and working? May I confirm it for me? What? Not really. What time is the accounting class? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And of course, I didn't go back well, to sleep. But are you waiting for like a day to finish this to, to say, okay, oh yeah, I'm here? Or is it a process? Yeah. Yeah. But, but he knows what he's doing. He's mine. I know. I was going to look over it because I wanted to tip my hand. No. Well, I did a lot of reading. I Googled it. I wanted to see how much it was. But at that rate. The single layout was different. So. The thing is, the only advice without knowing, we can talk. You know, it's here. The problem is, it's very difficult to work in that type of environment because he's got to welcome you in, uh, as opposed to you trying to knock your way through. I was one of the students, CFO, and it's his father. It's not even his father. Yeah, I got frustrated because he asked me. He asked me. To set up for me. <laughs> it was hard though. It took me a long time. I want to know what's going to be going on. Yeah, it took me like four or five hours. So I want to know why. And I know Larry will go watch it. Yeah, at that time, you're supposed to. Yeah, I'll go to the lobby. I'll go to the lobby. Oh, that's why and so the guy called me up and he said, this is my father, I'm going to call him. Yeah, to me, I figured it out. You didn't invite him from the beginning, and that's not the way I postured it. And then when I get it, it's the way that you're trying to do somebody a favor, and what it shows you is that the guy's way. Yeah, no, I mean, I got to make a decision. You might need to, you, you might need to do something apart of the cyber. Before, before, well, he's doing a lot of his estate mining. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share all that stuff with you. Yeah, I'm gonna share all those sites with you. Okay? I mean, you can take a picture of it. That's fine. But it's not. I No, no. But I definitely will share all those. Sites. Harold, I think you probably need to uh, make a decision. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, class, 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 class. We have none. Bye. We have no class. I am. <laughs> I'm taking my, my two minute break, okay? I don't you know I don't text while I'm teaching. I'm taking my break right now. Uh -huh. Okay, I, I, I don't know why I, uh, I cut this one out. Sometimes I put, what is this? The purpose of our lives is to be happy. That's from the Dalai Lama. The purpose of our lives is to be happy. So I'm going to share that with you. And one further. This one came from the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And it says, remember, O soul, that we have been placed on this planet for one thing and one thing only. 
to acquire a love of learning and to learn to love. What? Acquire a love of learning and to learn to love. But acquire a love of learning, I thought that was you know, relative or re relevant and important in this class. But anyway, I sent you a list of abbreviations and uh, terms that I think are important for us to know. I'm not going to go through all of them. I want to go through some of them. Uh, you have it. They come from this book. If I go over stuff and people aren't in this class and it's on the quiz later, you guys heard me, okay? So just I don't want people saying, oh, I didn't hear it. Okay, so anyway. So uh, some of this stuff, uh, abbreviations that we use. So look, we got all kinds of abbreviations, okay? I'm going to... I'll mention a couple of them that I think are you know, important. So if we take a look at the list of abbreviations that I sent, curiously, the first three or four, five, are, are entities or organizations that somehow have to do with accountants, okay? And those entities are important not only because the first one, for example, the AICPA is like, it's a professional guild. It's our, we don't have a union, we're not unionized, but it's, it's just like the bar or the school of architects, you know, the Institute of Architects. It is a professional society that advocates, uh, you know, for its members, okay? And to some extent does, and at times is provided directly or indirectly guidance in this industry. Some of these other ones, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the AIM, the, the Accounting Interpretation Board, the Accounting Principles Board is a precursor to the FASB, to the Financial Accounting Standards Board, which is another one of the, uh, which is which is the, the regulatory body that you made today, the, the standard setting body today. I'll get to that. Uh, CPI, we should know that in this industry, Consumer Price Index. It's an index that's published by the Department of Labor every month, right? And if, if for no other reason, we need to know the leases, most leases in this country are somehow tied to them. Please. Oh, I'm sorry. Look at the Oh, yeah. I see. The, the, the problem that I have, and you know, is, uh, is that I've had students, oh, I, I'm just writing my notes on this. And unfortunately, I'm, you know, people are chatting and all this stuff, and it really is very disruptive, so I'm sorry. No, it's right? fine. I just okay. it out. So. But listen, this is the only class we're going to have like this, so you know, you'll be fine after that, okay? Um, uh, FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, is an organization, it's an independent, freestanding organization that is made up of some accountants, but also people from industry, okay, and from academia. And they are the primary standard-bearing organization or guidance-providing organization for accountants today. So in this class, we're going to talk about things that are called FASBs or SFASs, Statements of Financial Accounting Standards Board, okay, but they are the pronouncements that the, this organization has been putting out since the late 1970s. I'll go in a little bit, I'll give you the sort of you know history of how these all came about, okay, if you want to know. HVAC, we know. The IASB, the International Accounting Standards Board, is a civil organization to the Financial Accounting Standards Board. So the International Accounting Standards Board is an international organization that does something similar to the FASB. Now, uh, the difference is, and this is critical, is in this country, we do not follow guidelines from the International Accounting Standards Board. We follow guidelines from the Financial Accounting Standards Board, okay? So we have in this country something what you call a U.S. gap, gap. So gap is not when you go to London and you have to mine the space between the, the platform and the train. Gap stands for generally accepted accounting principles, and we should know that. I'll use gap a lot. Generally accepted accounting principles. And when we talk in this country about GAAP, we are typically referring to U.S. GAAP. Now, why is that important? Well, when you look at a set of financial statements, if you know the, the, the principles under which it's been created, you can understand what those statements mean. If you are a company in India and you don't follow U.S. GAAP, and you don't follow international gap or UK gap or Canadian gap you follow yogi whatever gap you know you have no idea 
what those financial statements mean. I mentioned the other day, now this is kind of curious, and it has nothing to do with GAP. There's a company called Tesla out there that people seem to like. I mean, it's got this sort of like Zen type, uh, it's like a Ponzi scheme, but, but it's like got this Zen thing, so millennials love this guy, this Elon Musk guy. Oh, this guy's so cool, he's my, you know, he's my idol. It, he knows how to get money from people, that he knows. But curiously, and I'll give you guys a module on and one of the things I, one of the areas that I love to touch is uh, um, uh, these sort of adjustments to earnings. Every quarter companies, those who took the capital markets class know that every quarter companies have to provide, a public, public companies provide a filing with their results. And so what happens is, is the trend lately has been everybody reports adjusted earnings. And so what happens is in accounting, Adjustments typically are only made when things are infrequent, okay, and unusual in nature. Infrequent and unusual in nature. But if every quarter you have adjustments, they are neither infrequent nor unusual. Okay, so what people are doing is just window dressing. Now, curiously, in the last quarter, Tesla didn't even have adjustments to net income. They had adjustments to revenue. They were showing the public revenue that they were recording on, on products they hadn't sold yet. So, listen, as they say in Spanish, el papel lo aguanta todo, right? Paper holds everything. So, you can make things look any way you want them, but as readers, as informed readers of financial statements, why do we want to know GAAP? And what do we want to know the principles under which financial statements have been prepared? Because hopefully it tells us what they mean, okay? So, that's why we have Financial Accounting Standards Board, okay? So, just like the FASB, the Financial Accounting Board, issues pronouncements. The IASB also issues, uh, you know, uh, standards, you know, which are called International Accounting uh, Board statements, okay, or you know, uh, pronouncements. All right. Uh, the IRS, we know what the IRS is, right? The Infernal Revenue Service. They're the ones who take our money every month, okay. Uh, uh, different entities. So, you know, in this class, we'll throw about. Uh, um, every now and then terms related to structures, corporate structures. If time permits, I'll, I'll do what a typical operating structure company or company operating structure looks like in a real estate arena, okay? We tend to try to use tax effective structures. And so from that perspective, we use a lot of LLCs, limited liability companies, which by default will be treated as partnerships by the IRS. And partnerships are disregarded entities for taxation purposes. So what that means is that the entity does not pay tax. The income and expenses of the entity are passed directly through to the members or to the partners, okay? And so in real estate, you tend to see LLCs, you tend to see general or limited partnerships, okay? You tend to see um, um, LLLP, so you've got limited partnerships and you've got limited liability limited partnerships, okay? Uh, you, you could see subchapter S's, but you don't really see that, okay? But in theory, we're looking for pass-through entities. So LLCs, we don't really see MLPs anymore. There was a time in the 80s where there was a lot of real estate capital raised through syndications, and that was done through master limited partnerships. You see that now in infrastructure type, you know, plays, pipelines, you know, things like that. Uh, uh, um, you see that in the in, in energy industry. You don't really see it in real estate anymore. Uh, I, I talked about the AICPA. The AICPA has a, you know, the, the AICPA is it's the industry group. The REIT industry, the real estate investment trust industry, has an industry group as well. It's called NAREIT. NAREIT is a National Association of Real Estate Investment Trusts. If you want information on REITs, go to their website. There's a tremendous amount of information that they provide for free related to returns, by asset class, they've got white papers. Now, it's a very pro-REIT site, and it's a very pro-REIT organization, so they're always going to tell you why you should buy in a REIT. So, you know, buyer beware, okay? Just read with caution, but if you want to know about REITs, go to the name REIT site. It's very, you know, very helpful, very valuable. Okay. 
of the SEC, the Securities and Exchange uh, you know, Commission. Uh, we're going to talk about SPEs, SPVs, and VIEs, okay? Those are the three at the bottom. Well, there's two of them. So SPE, Special Purpose Entity, SPV, Special Purpose Vehicle, okay? Basically, one and the same. These, these are entities that are created with a sole or specific purpose, typically in real estate. A lot of times we will hold our assets in an SPV or an SPE, a special purpose entity or a special purpose vehicle, all right? A VIE will define specifically, a VIE comes in because of FIN30 and it deals with consolidations. We'll deal with that in the last class, but a, a VIE is a variable interest entity. You don't need to know that one today, but you will need to know that at the end of the term, okay? And we'll go through that. Now, I went, you know, in addition from this book, I got this glossary, and there's a bunch of stuff. Those of you who are in the program or finishing the program should know almost all of these. Now, you may not know all of these. Some of you are new in the program. You may not know all of these because some of these things are things that maybe haven't been seen recently in real estate, but there are things in real estate that come and go. I said to somebody the other day, I haven't seen a participating loan in I don't know how long. I go since the 1980s, mid-1980s. And he said, what's a participating loan? If you've taken the finance course or the investments course and you've got the Brueggemann book, it's definitely covered in the Brueggemann book. Perhaps Dr. Forgy doesn't cover them, but a participating loan is when the lender, in addition to collecting interest, is going to get participation in the profits. So maybe you've covered it, maybe you haven't. And I said to somebody, I haven't seen one of those in, you know, since the 1980s. And I said, we're doing one right now with a bank. So stuff that, you know, disappears sometime from favor comes back. So, you know, I would, I would encourage you guys to take a look at these things. ADC, we're going to talk about those. Acquisition, development, and construction loans. I haven't seen one of those in a while, but they do exist, okay? Uh, we should know in this class FFO and AFFO. FFO and AFFO. What is FFO? Funds from operations. What is FFO? I mean, you just described it, or you just gave me what the acronym stands for. What, what is funds for, from operations? I'd say, in my words, I'll use in my words, funds from operation is a proxy in the REIT arena for NOI. So it's essentially net income plus depreciation. So it's a measure of cash flow. So it's, it's actually a little bit more than that. It's, it's net income, add back depreciation, okay, and add back gains or losses on sales of assets, okay? But we need to know what FFO is. It's akin to NOI in a private arena, okay, in private equity real estate. What's AFFO? Ask a silly question, you're going to be a silly answer. What's AFFO? Adjusted funds from operations. So how do we adjust them? Okay, so going back to your comment, Michael. So AFFO is FFO plus we add back or subtract the straight line effect of rent. And you can say, what's that? Well, we'll cover that in another class, okay? And then we also have what? Plus or minus what? No, because that's already embedded here. We've already added that back. Uh, and any, any idea? No, we didn't read this stuff? Any other non-cash? Well, no, not non-cash, no, because non-cash, I mean, hopefully we don't have any of that stuff, right? Any non-recurring capital expenditures, okay? Okay? So again, what we're trying to get to are measures of, of, of cash flow, okay? By the way, while we're there, um, there's a couple of other acronyms that we use in this class or we throw around. PP&E, Plant Property and Equipment. Plant Property and Equipment. Is my handwriting that bad? But FFO plus, what is the SI? Straight line effect of rents. Plus or minus the, you know, by the way, it should be, it's, it's in your glossary, okay? So we should have looked at it. But these are things that I think we should know. These are sort of truths, you know. 
like, where am I from? Where am I going? What's FFO? I mean, it's just one of the basic truths. I'm just kidding. I mean, we don't. But we we kind of need to start, you know, learning some of these things. PP&E, plant, property, and equipment. FF&E, furniture, furniture, fixture, and equipment. Okay. So these are just acronyms that we throw around a lot of times. Okay. That we really, um, you know, should know. Okay. Um, a lot of the cap rate we talked about before. Some of the things we can, in this industry, build a suit or build on a speculative basis. So we can develop, what is a build a suit? For a specific tenant or a specific buyer because we can do a build to suit for sale or we can do a build to suit for lease. When we do something speculative, that means that we have no buyer or, or tenant, okay? Or we may have only a, a partial tenant, okay, or partial tenancy. And and all that has implications on how we account for things, okay? So we'll, we'll talk about all these things. Carried interest. Carried interest? You graduated carried interest. We should know all this stuff. It's like a performance fee that's... It's a promote. A In this industry, yeah. we call it a promote a lot of times. So it's an incentive. It is a participation in profits over and above our equity contribution. Very common in the development industry. Again, there's implications related to that, okay? Carrying costs. What are carrying costs? Well, not a loan. It's a cost of holding a property, right? So while we're holding a property, and so the question is, we don't need to know the answer right now. How do we deal with those? Do we, do we expense those? Or do we accrue them? Or or it depends. Well, it depends. It depends. It depends. It depends on what you. But we sunk costs are not defined in the in the FASBs. But the intention of the holding, we'll get to that in detail. Okay. But yeah, generally, we're not going to expense them in a current period. Okay. Common area maintenance costs. Cam. What's cam? What, 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 what are they? So they, well, shared, shared spaces or they are expenses related to, 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 to areas which are used by multiple tenants or multiple owners, right? And, and, and those expenses are then what? And, 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 and pass, presumably built. But again, there are accounting nuances related to that as well. Well, and it, it depends on the structure too. So sometimes they may be passed, maybe they're not. Maybe they're not passed in full. Maybe they're capped. Maybe they're pegged to an index. But there are accounting implications to all of these common area costs, okay? Um, condominiums, you know, so it's, it's an interest, right? In, a, in, a, in an undivided interest in a, a common property, okay? I'm not going to get into some of these, like, you know, Costs incurred and incidental operations. So we'll get into all of these things in in uh, in greater detail. Upreach and downreach. We're not going to get into those in this class, but they're the different oh, uh, partnership structures in which REITs, you know, can be uh, can be can can be held or owned. Imminent domain. What is imminent domain? The government takes a property for. The government okay, takes. Use. Yeah. So, so I, 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 I don't know. I, I don't know exactly what the what the literal benefit. For the yeah. Benefit. I don't know what the literal translation is, but it's when the government, and I say the government because there is a a growing trend, and I don't know that that's been finalized in the courts yet. That that private users may also avail themselves of the right of taking a property for a greater good. Okay, and so imminent domain is when the government comes in, right? The government comes in and 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 takes your property. Uh, we're going to go into it in greater detail, but there's a section of the Internal Revenue Code that deals with that, which is Section 1033, which is sem similar to 1031, and we might as well just sort of mention that. What are like-kind exchanges? What are like-kind exchanges? When you say you sell, it's an, I just said it's an exchange. Like, when you change property. So the money, you have to put it into another property. Okay, let's, 
No, no. There's let's, no money. Let's, no. let's back up. So I'm not talking about tax codes. You're talking to me about tax codes. I'm talking about what is the underlying business nature of a like-kind exchange? Similar property. Exchange of similar property. So, so it's when two owners exchange property. Yeah. Now, it may involve boot, what's called boot or not. What's boot? Boot. boot. I didn't say something else. I didn't put a letter at the end of that. I just said that's, boot. That's a the cash contribution. Okay, so it's so I'll give you a real life example. Three or four years ago, a REIT called Avalon Bay, Avalon Bay, exchanged. I believe it was with UHR. Okay, with another REIT, they exchanged 300 million, 300 plus million dollars worth of apartments of multifamily assets. Why? Because they just worked out a deal that it made more sense for these guys that were more, I forget which one it was, one was more East Coast centric and the other one was more West Coast centric to say, you know what, we can't properly manage those, but we can manage these. And so they swapped the ownership. So they exchanged similar assets. Now, they got an appraisal and then somebody had to give somebody else the boot. I forget which, you know, it was like, they didn't nail it exactly, right? So somebody had to give somebody, you know, an extra at ten million or whatever dollars to make it even. Okay. Now, that's what the economic nature of the transaction is. Okay, is when people when people exchange assets. Okay. Now, now you want to go step one step further and say, as a result of that, there is a section in the Internal Revenue Code that deals with like kind exchanges, which is called. Section 1031. Now, well, I, I don't want to go into it today because we're going to, you know, lose. There are rules related to, and in fact, these, this treatment is not necessarily that similar to a true exchange anymore. It's been very liberalized, okay? And that's caused a lot of behavioral changes in the way real estate is transacted and the way it's financed. In my mind, for example, this has a lot to do with the elimination of seller financing. You know, um, a lot of times people were, they, they didn't have the incentive to reinvest, so they would rather sell an asset, take back a bunch of paper, and recognize profits under a percentage of completion method, which led them to further profits. You know, now you want the cash so you can reinvest it and not pay the gain. So I, I don't want to get into the rules of that, we'll do that in the last class, we'll have plenty of time to do that, but, but Section 1031 is a, is a section of the Internal Revenue Code that deals with like-kind exchanges and does allow us to defer the gain on a real estate transaction. Curiously, when there's imminent domain, Section 1033 allows us very similar treatment. And, and because the government has taken, it actually is more liberal. And the single biggest you know, difference is, is it, you typically have 180 days in which to find, you know, identify, and replace the property in, a, in an imminent domain transaction. When the government is taking your property, you can essentially replace it within a two-year period. They give you a much longer period to identify replacement property and therefore, you know, um, um, defer any potential gain that you may have had. And, and managed properly, it, it sounds as if the government comes take your land, you're not going to make money. I had a boss who once said the highest and best use for land was eminent domain. Because if you get a good eminent domain attorney, you can get the government to pay pretty big for what you have. So eminent domain is not necessarily bad from an economic perspective, okay? So um, it may be good for the community, but it may be good for the property owner as well if it's managed um, correctly. Um, Equity REITs, equity REITs are different than mortgage REITs in that equity REITs hold ownership. So their, their passive income is rents. Mortgage REITs, their passive income comes from interest, from collecting interest on loans that have been made to real estate entities, okay? Uh, um, fee simple is an absolute right to ownership in land. Now there's a lot of different ones that are disclosed here. Some of the ones that are disclosed here, there, there's like, joint tenancy, when you've got two owners where the right of ownership passes to another one upon death. I'm not an attorney, so, but you gotta know these things, right? There's tenant in common. So there's, where there's multiple, more than one tenant that have the same rights, right? 
We talked about condominium ownership, which is an undivided interest in a common property. I don't have co-op in here, but a cooperative is something similar to condominium, but you own, I believe, a share in an entity that has you know, the entire ownership. So there's a lot of different ways to own ownership, uh, to own um, a real estate. Some of the ones that are in here, we'll go in a separate section, deal with um, uh, time sharing. And timeshares themselves have three or four different methods of passing ownership, whether it's interval or, or, or otherwise. So we'll go through all of those. Um, don't need to go through all of these things. So we did that one. Um, lease. What is a lease? What is a lease? So it's a right to use. It's a right to use property. Now obviously as it relates in the context of this class, it's a right to use real estate, but there's something missing for a definite period of time. No, for a definite period of time. You can have a lease that could be for 30 days. But again, without being an attorney, contracts have to have a termination date. There has to be an end to them. They can't be open-ended. So, so a lease is a right to use, in this class, a right to use real estate for a definite period of time. Now, what's real estate in this class? What's real estate? In this class. Land and improvements thereon. Land and improvements thereon, okay? So, you know, listen, real estate's gonna be something different in a different class, right? You know, you go to an architectural class and they're going to tell you it's something beautiful and artistic and, and you know, you know something else, right? So, um, lease commencement. This is an interesting one. Lease commencement. We don't. What is a lease commencement date? The beginning of the lease. The start date. Okay. You, you got to remember that a lease term or a lease comm commencement is when a lease technically starts, it does not necessarily have to be occupancy, right? Okay, and you have to be careful with that because a lot of times you get into, you know, contests about, well, when does rent start? Well, rent starts ticking the day of the lease commencement. Now, there may be an abatement period. What's an abatement period? Uh, free rent. Free rent period, right? So, there may be a period that you don't pay, but sometimes you go, oh, yeah, but I didn't occupy the space. Yeah, but the lease, the commencement date you signed was this. So. You always need to, you know, know those things, okay? Uh, leasehold improvements. What are leasehold improvements? Tenant, well, tenant improvements, I was say. But it's, it's basically a build the suite. So you get a white shell, company moves in, you build it for their specific So, needs. So, but leasehold improvements are improvements that are made on property that's leased, right? Mm -hmm. Property that's been given a right to use, which in most cases, or I should say by custom in this country, are typically done on the account of the owner. The owner makes that as an accommodation or as an enticement to the to the tenant. Okay, the, the landlord will make those improvements or up to a certain dollar amount or up to a certain allowance or certain improvements. Okay, and we got to figure out how we account for those things as well. So I mean, these are all things that are um, um, sort. I, I won't spend time. Mineral rights are very interesting, especially here in Florida and in South Florida. We have a tremendous amount of mining. We don't know it. Uh, but, you know, we've got the Lake District just, you know, just west of the Turnpike here, where all of the aggregate, all of the rock that you know is used for concrete and for structural bases is mined in Florida. And there's some more on the way up to Lake Okeechobee, but the bulk of it is done here. And so, who owns the mineral rights? That's, you know, that's that's a use of real estate. Real estate would be used for, you know, from a cash perspective, not for building on top, but for extracting its value. It could be rock, it could be rock, but it could be oil, it could be gas, right? It could be, you know, it could be a lot of, it could be iron ore, it could be silver, it could be gold. So the value of real estate is not just the ability to build on it, but it could be to exploit it, right? It could be to farm it. There's a lot of different ways to take a look at, uh, at real estate. Um, we'll skip these. We'll go into all of these in... Uh, We'll go into all of these in greater detail. So a lot of these things we're gonna, we are going to go into much greater um, detail 
in each one of the because all of these terms and, and definitions old and these you know what's in the glossary ultimately come back to terms that we need to know when we are accounting for development costs or accounting for sales of real estate okay or the leasing of real estate so um, I would keep it handy I think it's I think it's it's, it's helpful okay now to jump things around a little bit because I want to make sure we cover this. If, if time permits, I, I can't, like it's impossible in an hour to teach people accounting, okay? Um, some of you may have had accounting. In fact, you know, most people that have an undergraduate degree in business should have had an accounting class and and should know, should know. I mean, listen, I, I don't want to like say it's like the most important of all the disciplines of business, but it really is. <laughs> now, you're going to say, oh, he's, he's biased, he's an accountant. Um, you know, going back to the thought that knowledge is power, um, if you can understand numbers, and if you can understand the relationship in numbers, it gives you a tremendous amount of power. And, and what I've noticed over the years, and, and not really just you know because I'm, I'm teaching you know this accounting class, um, the amount of people that have incredible business knowledge but then become handicapped because they don't understand what the numbers mean. You know, and at the end of the day, why do we want numbers? You know, why do we do accounting? You know, kind of kind of bridge a couple of things together. Why do we do accounting? Accounting is nothing more than the history of a company, the financial history of a company. So accounting is, is record keeping or bookkeeping all of the transactions that a company has had. So well, why would we want to know? Those of you who have been in my previous classes, I always say there's three reasons why you want to know your accounting. Okay? You want a benchmark. You always want a benchmark. And when you benchmark with numbers, you want a benchmark against three different things. Number one, you want to benchmark against previous periods. You want to benchmark, how am I doing, you know, how did I do this year compared to the previous year? Did I do better? Did I do worse? And why? Right? Because once you know if you did or how you did, then you can figure out the why. And if you didn't do as well, you can fix it. If you did well, hopefully you can, you know, sort of accentuate that a little bit and continue to do better. So we always want to benchmark against previous periods. We want to benchmark against expectations. Our budgets, in real estate in particular, how did, what did we expect, what did we plan, and how did we do? And the third level of benchmarking is how do we do against our peers? I was, the example I always use, I worked, before I got into real estate many years ago, I, when I was in high school I used to run printing presses. So, you know, I, you know, I, I'm a printer. I, you know, it's it's ancient technology, okay? But, you know, and I, I, in college, I ran a student-owned print shop, and then, I, sort of, I worked in a print, printing company with my dad, who was is also a CPA. He's retired now, but he had a lot of printing companies as as clients. And so, long story short, I, when I was a kid, I worked at one, and then when I left Price Waterhouse, I went to work for one of my my dad's other clients. And this guy was a, this guy was an SOB. Like everything that you could do wrong, like the, like mess with customers, I learned from that guy, which isn't good, which isn't good, but it's all knowledge, right? So it's all knowledge. So it's like, this guy was like, we worked like our base pay was we worked six days a week. We worked at a factory in Hialeah, and it really was like a factory in Hialeah. You know, we worked, you know, we worked six days a week for your your weekly pay. And you know, this guy had like a mistress in the company. I mean, it was like just like a mess. Everything, you know, he'd pay all his personal expenses out of it. It was just like terrible, terrible, terrible. One of the things this guy always told me was, he goes, I make money because I buy paper cheaper than anybody else in town. And I believed him. You know, so I want to give you a, a relative sum. So we were roughly paying something like 40 cents a pound for a 
pretty bad grade of paper at the time. So about a year and a half later, I was able to break out. I went to work for like what was the nicest company in the industry, not only in the state, but one of the nicest ones in the country, you know. And just as a frame of reference, um, we were paying at that company something like 36 cents per pound for a much higher grade of paper. And why do I bring this up? Because within the context or the confines of the company I was in, this guy honestly believed he was buying better than everybody else, but he never took the time to really you know, find out. And why was he paying more? Well, one, he didn't have the volume that this company had, but because he paid late, because he you know, screwed his vendors, you know, he short paid them, always had complaints, yada, yada, yada. I mean, I, that's, a whole other, that's a whole other master's class what I learned in that year and a half. But, <laughs> But the point is, is, we have to know what everybody else is doing. And when I give you the supplementals to look at, it's to gain knowledge on how quality real estate operators are performing. What are their benchmarks like? You know, and that's what we need to do continually. What are people paying for property? What are people paying to, to operate property? What are lease payments that are people getting? So, so at the end of the day, we could think that we're really good, but it's not what we think. It's what the facts tell us, okay? Versus history, versus our expectations, and versus our peers, okay? So that's why we do accounting. Accounting, um, so accounting's a profession that, that I'm interlacing a couple of these different things. Modern day accounting um, dates back to the Renaissance. So there was a guy named, I used to ask this question in a quiz. There was a, 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 a monk, a, a Venetian monk named Luca Pacciola, who actually was the one who's credited with, you don't need to know this today though, but uh, Luca Pacciola was a guy who was credited with um, what, we, what we call the double entry system of accounting, okay? And so he's the one that kind of, kind of came up with this whole thing where there's two sides to an equation. <coughs> For every debit, there's a credit. But, but the real question is, is why did this come up? So the Venetians, the people from Venice, were the merchants of the Renaissance. And so they were continually trading with the Far East and with other people. And what they needed to do was keep a record or an account of, of all of these transactions. So, so the need for, now there were other methods of accounting in the past, but, but in this Renaissance, all this knowledge coming out of Italy, right? Um, at least they're credited with the creation of this double entry system of accounting, which is what we use today. Okay, so uh, sort of an informal setting, it's created, you know, there's a whole evolution. The accounting profession kind of takes off probably I would say in England in you know latter part of the 19th century with the industrial age. And that's when you start getting these uh, you know large accounting firm. I think today there's like what they call the big four. When I came out of college it was the big A, you know, and then there was like a little A and all that kind of stuff. But so the, the accounting profession um, starts formalizing with, with the industrial age. And with that, start, you know, starts coming a more standardization or formalization, right? So that, again, going back to my financial statements should look like your financial statements should look like your financial statements, right? As I said, not even in statements, you know, it, just in REITs, the multifamily supplemental reports all look like one another. The industrial ones all look like one another. The retail ones all look like one another. Okay, because investors, because lenders, because other vested or interested parties want to be able to compare and contrast. Okay, so as the industry evolves and all that, different bodies start coming out. Okay, so um, the, the the first sort of formalized in this country iteration, there was something called the ARB. I don't think you need to know that one today, but the ARB came out. Um, those, I think this was an offshoot of the American Institute. Um, and I think sometime in the late 1940s, early 1950s, they, they sort of codified uh, you know, all the accounting knowledge. And they kind of said, hey, listen, uh, this, is, this is GAP going forward. You know, they just kind of said, hey, a bunch of smart guys got in a room and they said, okay, this is how we deal with inventories, this is how we deal with receivables, <laughs> this is how we deal with pro property equipment, this is how we deal with that. You know, this, and they, they kind of codified it. So they, the accounting research bulletins, right? And I think that was all codified under ARB 51, I think, if memory serves me right. So 
That gave way in the 1960s into the 1970s. There was an organization called the APB, the Accounting Principles Board, which again, either was a direct offshoot of the American Institute or, or I know, they're like, I know, you're gonna shoot yourself, but. No, no, no. No, no, no you, you would, I would shoot myself too. I mean, but, 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 so the APB then issues like 30 something pronouncements. The Accounting Principles Board issues all these pronouncements, right? And then sometime in the late 1970s to today, somebody says, hey, we need to have an independent organization. And that's where the <coughs> Financial Accounting Standards Board comes through. And so if you get an idea, when I was a sophomore in college, um, FASB 13 came out. That's the one that deals with leases. We'll get to that in a second. But So this is like around 1980. So I don't know where they are today. They're like somewhere near 200, okay? And now they're dealing with some very nebulous topics. So, so what happens is as time has gone on, somebody said, hey, this isn't comprehensive enough to deal with everything that's happening in the business. So the accounting principles board came in and started providing guidance on how do you deal with consolidations, you know? Uh, you know, and there was a technique that was called pooling of interest. So, you know, how do you, how do you pool interest or how do you consolidate on a line by line basis? and so on. And then when this Financial Accounting Standards Board comes out, um, they start issuing their pronouncements. It's like I say, they're like at 200 and something, but, but what's happened over time, which is really complicated things is, it used to be that when I started teaching this class, I would tell my students, hey, it's very simple. You know, 13 deals with leases. So anything related to leases, FASB number 13. Anything related to construction period interest? Number 34, construction period interest. <coughs> we'll go into this in detail in all of the classes that we have. Sales of real estate, simple, 66, sales of real estate. So, development costs, simple. Over 67. Notice how I know all these things off the top of my head, right? Okay. So these four FASBs really form, and really these three kind of form the basis of what we deal with, uh, you know, in, in, in our industry. Okay, now we've got some ancillary ones that we're going to, or pronouncements that we're going to deal with, okay? Um, I may mention something called FASB-5, which deals with commitments and contingencies. So for example, I buy land, it's got contamination issues. How do I deal with the potential cleanup costs? How do I account for those? I don't know. You don't need to know that today. Okay? You, you, you may know at the end of the class. You may not know, but you may know you got a problem and you got to talk to your accountant. That's what I want you guys to know. I don't necessarily need you at the end of the class to know all of the particular rules to all of these. We'll go through these, but what I want you to be aware of is the fact that, hey, uh, I'm sorry, um, hey, we're going to sell something, and I'm thinking about, we're thinking about taking some paper back on this. Let me talk to my CFO and make sure that we can recognize profit or not, okay? Or, hey, listen, um, we're going to buy some land, and it's going to sit around for five years. Uh, am I going to have to incur all these carrying costs as expenses or am I going to have a basis to defer them to a future period so I'm not showing losses all the time? Okay, so what I want you is to understand that there's implications to this that ultimately are going to show in the financial statements, okay? Uh, when we deal with things like, like uh, and I got to go because I don't remember all of these things. 144 and 157 deal with valuation issues and what is now called okay so the concept now is we talk about something called fair value okay so ultimately is an asset stated at fair value in, in th those of you who may have an, an accounting background when we deal with inventories and um, in, in real estate, we can deal with inventories. If we're a home builder, we have inventories. And, and from a tax perspective, there are implications to being a dealer. If you have inventory, there are certain rules that you follow 
as opposed to being a developer that you don't carry inventory, you're not a dealer. But um, when you're dealing with inventory, there's a concept that's known on the financial statements or on the face of the financial statements, we always state inventory at the lower of cost or market. There are a series of basic or underlying principles to accounting. As accountants, we are conservative in nature. And so before the Dow, before the Dow, we are always going to take a more pessimistic or conservative view to things. Okay? So, so we're going to speak softly, right? And we're going to let performance later, you know, speak for itself. So if if I bought if I bought 15 lots of land for a hundred dollars each and and there's there's a downturn in the market and they're worth 80. I can't carry them on my books for my cost. I have to carry them at market, okay? And so that whole concept of lower of cost or market, as it relates to real estate, we're gonna get into detail later on, we're gonna talk about fair value, but that also deals with your long, long use assets. So if you own real estate for lease, that's also subject to a fair value assessment on an annual basis, okay? Um, um, we won't deal with this, but just so that you know, FASB 109 deals with accounting for real, for accounting for uh, income taxes, okay? Which is not Internal Revenue Service regulations, but it's how, yes, Gayan? So with Pardeco's, uh, one of the so, partners um, from the case study, would their property have been? Okay, so, so all of the, so I, I'm, I'm, because this session's only four hours, you're going to get a whole detailed explanation of what the suggested answers are to that case, okay? And you're going to have the video so you can go through it slowly. Every one of those stupid examples that was given, because they were all seemingly silly questions, all ultimately talk to what we call GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles, and GAAP by default is accrual-based, not cash-based. So. Expenses, when we report in GAAP, expenses and revenue are recorded when they are earned or incurred, not when the transaction is actually affected. So, if I contract with Angelo for service, and he performs that service, and I've received the benefit, even if he hasn't billed me yet, I have to recognize the expense. From Angelo's perspective, once he's done that service and rendered it, whether he's issued the bill or not, or gotten paid or not, he's going to recognize revenue. Now, there were transactions here where payment was made before service was rendered. Okay, so we had prepayments or deposits looked at from the other side. There were situations where services were rendered but not billed. So, so we had to, so all, each one of those silly items ultimately talked to as it relates to real estate, how some of this stuff is going to go there, okay? So, but your specific question was? Just the property valuation and accounting for the... Okay, so there was no fair value issue there, okay? There was no fair value issue there, uh, because ultimately that was sold for much more than, you know, what they were carrying it for, okay? So fair value didn't come into play there. Um, what are some other ones that we'll talk about? Okay. Um, uh, APB 29 and FIN 30 will deal with consolidations or reporting for entities, okay? And we'll deal with that in the last class, okay? So these are sort of the, now, but what's happened is, the reason I drew all this stuff is, and what I don't know, to, so all these things are out there, right? So some FASBs supersede APBs. Some FASBs supersede other FASBs. But more complicated than that, you get all these things like these FINs and AINs and all kinds of other interpretations of these documents. And so you've got a cluster. What's happened is, is we've got a cluster of guidance out there. So about five years ago, six years ago, something like that, it's a process that's been going on for a while. The accounting profession decided that they were going to come up with something what they call codification. So we're going to codify things not by, so heretofore, we always talked about the underlying pronouncement that gave us guidance on something, now they're going to say, no, 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 we're going to break things up by concept 
And then we're going to sort of group all these little things that apply to a particular concept, and we're going to put them under an umbrella. Because what was happening is, every year you'd pull up FASB 13, and you'd have to see things that were strike, you know, struck, and you'd have to see what replaced that language. So now, and I don't know these off the top of my head, okay? But, I'm a, I know these off the top of my head, but, so, I know that I'm 835, so ASC, codification 835, deals with construction period interest. 36020 and 976 deal with sales. 910 deals with accounting for entities. 820 deals with fair value. 360 deals with costs. And leases, leases is a whole, whole other issue altogether. Um, so leases is 842 ACS, four, but there's actually been a new pronouncement which I'm going to send to you overnight so you can read it, which was issued last year. So it's, it was issued in 2016, okay? And uh, I'll send that to you at the end of the class. So anyway, so what's happened is, 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 there's a cluster of guidance, okay? And we used to refer to the guidance that related to things by, by the specific issue, by the specific document that issued it. Now we go by these concepts, right? So section 842 of this accounting codification series deals with leases. 835 deals with construction period interest costs. 360 deals with real estate, okay? Development costs in subsection 20 deals with sales, okay? 820 deals with valuation issues, which may or, not just, may, may or may not just be real estate related. It may be a broader, you know, so this is like crazy stuff, but I just needed to share it with you, okay? Because as the course goes on, I will talk about, hey, this week we're dealing with 842 or, or 13, okay? Or we're dealing with 360, which is, what used to be 67, which are development costs, okay, okay and so forth. You going to expect us to remember these? Uh, you might need to know some of these. And, and what they uh, relate to. Some of these you might you might want to take a look at. That's why I've taken the time to write that because you're going to keep hearing them over and over and over again. So you may want to. Yes, Ken. So the ACS has taken the place of. Um, it hasn't taken a place. What it does is, it, if you want to kind of take a look at, right? So what the ACS has done is, is basically taken all of this guidance and said, okay, so we've got guidance that comes from a bunch of different buckets, okay? So I've got, you know, FASB pronouncements, I've got APBs, I've got FINs, etc. And so what, what it does is it, it collects all these by subject matter into a bucket here that kind of goes from 100 to 900, which is by concept. Does that explain it better? So it's kind of an attempt to simplify. It's an attempt to group and simplify all of this knowledge, right? Now, frankly for me, this was easier to follow, but you get to a point that you get old enough that you get stuck in your ways, right? So, you know, my nephew who works at KPFG now, he wouldn't follow this because he wasn't trained this way, you know? He was trained to look up by concepts. So, so now, when I used to do research, when I worked at accounting firms and I did research, I would go to the FASB, well, the books then, now you just go to the site, but you, I would go to the books and then I would look in the index, the topical index, and say, okay, what deals with real estate sales? And it would tell me 66. So I would go to 66. Now you go to this index that says, hey, what deals with real estate sales? And you just go to that chapter, which has grouped all this information that comes from the buckets. And as new information comes out, it gets filtered down to those buckets. So it's kind of like the index is in the front, and all the, the bits and pieces have been cut and put under the index as opposed to having an index in the back taking you back to the source document. 
it's just an, a way of grouping all of this knowledge that's out there. And, and so you're going to say, why is this stuff so complicated? Well, the problem is, you know, in 1940s, they weren't trading derivatives, for example, you know? Um, you know, people weren't doing all the swaps that people are doing now. Synthetic leases hadn't come out, you know? Nobody was doing leasing at all. Synthetic leases. Mm. Synthetic leases. A synthetic lease. So a synthetic lease, and that's one of the descriptions, was, was an attempt, was an attempt by, by going back to innovators, right, financial innovators, to circumvent the rules of FASB 13 that would require some individuals to recognize future liabilities on the face of their balance sheet. So that when, and again, you'll hear more about this next week, when you look at the financial statements today of companies like CVS, Walgreens, McDonald's, they don't on the face of their financial statements recognize the liabilities related to the future obligations, the minimum lease payments under their lease contracts. That's going to change by next year, okay, with the new guidance that's been provided. But synthetic leases, more targeted for development and build the suits, were attempts to circumvent the rules. So, so to create the illusion, to create the illusion that there was what's called an operating lease as opposed to what we call a capital lease, so that you would get, you know, one treatment rather than another, right? But it ultimately goes back. We'll talk about when we get to FIN 30, when we talk about Section 910, when we talk about consolidation, right? When we talk about these VIEs, these variable interest entities, you know what? If it smells like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a cup, it's a duck, right? And what's happened a lot of times is if, if, if people are coming to you as the accountant or the CFO with all these reasons why not to do something, and, and sort of, if you've got to go, let's go back to what's um, uh, ultimately what we want to take a look at is the substance of a transaction and not the form. So when we're accountants, because of our conservative nature, we want to go to the substance of a transaction, not to the form, okay? Because a lot of times all these innovators <coughs> and attorneys that get paid a lot of money are creating structures to obviate the rules that we have required so that ultimately a prudent reader of your financial statements derives what, what a prudent you know, reader would derive from the results. Okay, and so all of a sudden like a company like Walgreens doesn't have nine billion dollars of future obligations as liabilities, it's hidden in the footnote somewhere maybe a prudent reader of those statements isn't going to derive what a prudent reader would get out of those. So people are continually trying to obviate these requirements. You know, these people aren't just creating rules for the sakes of creating rules. They're creating rules that ultimately provide some sort of clarity to what the financial statements are. So that when you look at a set of financial statements, you go, oh, okay, I know what that means. And those are usually done reactive. I'm sorry? It was usually well, it's, it's well, never proactive. Well, well, it started out proactive. No, and now but, it's like, oh, we got yeah, But you haven't, Mike, we haven't taken the, 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 the cap, capital markets class. What we kind of talk about in that class is there's this paradigm where you wind up with typically, at more on the legal side, you get some sort of regulation, and then called in a positive way, people come up with innovation, right? So somebody comes up with a rule, and then somebody figures out how to work around it, which gives rise to new rules, which give rise to more ways of working around it, okay? And so, yeah, a lot of times this follows what somebody's done to circumvent what's, you know, what's, you know, being done there. And, and most of this stuff is, is definitely after the fact. <coughs> People create transactions, and now you got to figure out how you account for it, you know? And again, I go back to, if, if you don't deal with financial statements every day, I, there's a certain rule that I, that, that well, there's certain rules that I follow. But as an investor, as an investor, uh, I look at a set of financial statements and I derive conclusions from what I read, from the relationships between the numbers and from what I'm seeing. So 
When I'm looking at financial statements and I look at things like, okay, what's tangible net worth per share? For example, um, and, and I already started with what's tangible net worth as opposed to total net worth, right? Um, so what, how, what's the relationship with that to market value? When I start look, taking a look at things like trailing earnings, you know, multiple. So what's, what's, what, what multiple is trading? I'm using the assumption in my mind, maybe blindly, that those financial statements have been prepared in accordance to GAAP so that, so that the conclusions that I derive are not based upon the presumption that those statements are false or phony, but rather that those statements mean what they say they mean. Now, if I don't have that certainty, I can't do what I do. I can't invest in the stock of a company. I, I, bought, I bought into a, a REIT yesterday because I believe, I believe that the underlying valuation is less than market value. Now, sadly, that particular REIT, three years ago, was involved in some accounting scandals in which, in which your know, stock went from like 30 down to 3, and, and I didn't buy it for three years until management has been flushed out, a bunch of write-offs were done, a bunch of time has now passed, right? And now I'm seeing some earnings momentum that I can believe because I couldn't believe for three years what I was looking at, okay? And so ultimately,